In this video, I will demonstrate the installation of an RP2040 with PicoFly on the switch light. It is a CPU glitch-based modification that loads a payload before the Nintendo Sign software bootloader. Please note that this mod is not recommended for beginners due to the high risk of damaging small parts, which can be challenging to fix without the appropriate tools. However, if you acquire all the necessary tools, learning the process should become relatively straightforward. First, I will provide an overview of all the parts and tools I will be using in this video. Next, I will explain the process of setting up the RP2040 and preparing the MOSFETs. Afterward, I will demonstrate how to open the switch light safely and easily. Then, I will guide you through the process of removing the heat spreader with minimal effort. Next, I will explain the importance of applying flux to the pads, tinning them, and soldering the wires. I will then demonstrate the proper technique for soldering the MOSFETs onto the CPU and thoroughly clean any residual flux from the board. Following that, I will provide step-by-step -step instructions on soldering the RP2040, followed by a quick test to ensure everything is functioning properly. I will then explain my approach to routing the wires and applying a solder mask, followed by a final test, before closing up the switch light. Disclaimer, the information provided in this video is for educational and informational purposes only. The content presented is based on personal experiences and research, and it is important to note that individual results may vary. The processes and techniques demonstrated in this video involve working with electronic components and soldering, which can carry risks if not done properly. It is crucial to exercise caution and take necessary safety precautions, including wearing appropriate protective gear and using tools and equipment as instructed by their manufacturers. Please note that modifying or tampering with electronic devices, such as game consoles, may void warranties and could potentially damage the device if not executed correctly. It is recommended to consult professional technicians or seek expert advice before attempting any modifications or repairs. The creator of this video and the AI model providing guidance cannot be held responsible for any damages, injuries, or losses that may occur as a result of following the information presented in this video. Viewers are solely responsible for their actions and should proceed at their own risk taking into consideration their own skill level, knowledge, and experience. Always prioritize safety and ensure a proper understanding of the steps involved before attempting any modifications or repairs. If uncertain, it is advised to seek professional assistance. By proceeding with this video, you acknowledge and accept the risks associated with modifying electronic devices and agree to hold harmless the creator and AI model, for any consequences that may arise from your actions. For this project, you will need the following tools. A temperature-controlled soldering iron is highly recommended, along with a hot air station for removing the Type-C connector. A magnifying glass with a minimum magnification of 20x. I personally use the 40AO Scientific Instruments Inspection Microscope, which I obtained from a yard sale for $20. I modified it by rotating the lens and removing unnecessary components. If you don't have access to this microscope, you can choose one that suits your needs and budget. Tweezers, a Phillips 00, and a Tri-Point-Y00 screwdriver. You can purchase a kit that includes these tools and more. UV light and UV glasses for safety when working with ultraviolet components. A magnetic flexible gooseneck metal with alligator clips for helping hands. This will be useful for securely holding the RP2040 during soldering. A soldering mat to assist with organizing screws and small parts. Flesh cutters for trimming excess wire or components. Please note that these are the essential tools for this specific project. Depending on your individual preferences and requirements, you may need additional tools or equipment. In addition to the tools mentioned earlier, you will also need the following consumables for this project. Leaded solder 6040 its rosin core solder. This type of solder is commonly used for electronic soldering due to its melting point and good conductivity. Flux. It is recommended to use Amtic Flux, which you can find a link to in the video description. Flux helps improve soldering performance and promotes better wetting and adhesion. 34 A WG Magnet Wire This thin wire is used for making connections and soldering various components. Thermal Paste You will need thermal paste to ensure proper heat transfer between components, such as the CPU and heat spreader. Viscous Thermal Paste A product like K5 Pro is recommended for its viscosity 
which allows for easy application and better coverage. Captain Tape A 1-inch wide Captain Tape is suggested for securing and insulating wires or components during the process. 91% or 99.99% isopropyl alcohol. This alcohol is used for cleaning surfaces and removing any residue or flux after soldering. UV solder mask. UV solder mask is used to protect and insulate soldered connections. Make sure to use a solder mask compatible with UV light curing. These consumables are necessary for the successful completion of the project. You can refer to the video description for any specific links or recommendations provided there. To complete this project, you will need the following parts, which can be ordered from DigiKey RP2040. I recommend using the Seed Studio Xiao RP2040 because of its ease of removing the Type-C connector and buttons, as there are no components on the back that need special attention during the soldering process. 47 ohm 0805 resistors. It is advisable to get more than three resistors, such as 50, to reduce the price to 2 cents per resistor. Having extra resistors is always helpful in case of any unforeseen issues or mistakes. MOSFETs. Specifically, the IRFHS 8342 TRPBF MOSFETs are recommended. It is recommended to get more than two of these, as they are small and easy to misplace during the installation process. Alternatively, if you are comfortable with a longer shipping time of one to two weeks from China, you can consider getting the flex cable MOSFETs. Please note that availability and pricing may vary, so it's always a good idea to check the DigiKey website for the most up-to-date information and to place your order. Before we begin the modification process, it is important to ensure that the console is fully functional. Perform a thorough test of all the buttons, sticks, and Wi-Fi functionality. If you have recently purchased the console and find that it is not working correctly, consider returning it or requesting a partial refund to resolve any issues. It is crucial to have a console in good working condition before proceeding with the modification. To begin, we will flash the RP2040 with the PicoFly firmware. If you are using the Xiao RP2040, you need to bridge the two bottom right pins to indicate to the firmware which RP2040 model you are using. Once this is done, Follow these steps. Connect the RP2040 to a Windows computer while holding down the boot button on the RP2040. Please note that this method currently does not work on Mac, but it may work on Linux, although this hasn't been tested. The RP2040 should appear as a USB drive and open a file explorer window. Drag and drop the .uf2 firmware file, which you can obtain from the GitHub repository, onto the RP2040 drive. Once the flashing process is complete, the RP2040 will automatically unmount, and the LED will flash yellow once. You can verify the firmware by pressing the reset button or unplugging and replugging the RP2040. The LED should flash blue once, followed by three yellow flashes, repeating three times. If you do not see any LED light, double check that you have bridged the correct pins. With the correct firmware successfully flashed, you can proceed to remove the Type-C connector and buttons. Use the alligator clip to hold the RP2040 flat and steady, allowing enough space to access the area with a hot air tool. While optional, you can apply flux for easier soldering. Begin by removing the buttons, followed by the Type-C connector. To tin the pads of the RP2040 that will be used, apply flux to the reset, clock, CMD, DAT0, CPU, ground, and 3V3 pins, and then tin them with solder. Place the resistors on the CLK, CMD, and DAT0 pads. Apply additional flux as needed. Ensure that there are no solder bridges, and if any are present, apply flux and remove them. Once you have finished soldering, Clean the RP2040 using 91% or higher isopropyl alcohol to remove any flux residue. These steps will prepare the RP2040 for further modifications and ensure a clean and properly functioning setup. To prepare the MOSFETs for installation, follow these steps. To secure the MOSFETs, you will need to clamp them in place. You can use two small flat PCB boards taped underneath your microscope or a piece of glass will work as well. The goal is to ensure that the MOSFETs do not move during the soldering process. Cut three pieces of wire, each approximately 2 inches 50 millimeters, or slightly longer. Additionally, cut two pieces of wire that are 5 inches 120 millimeters, or longer. Tin the shorter wires by applying solder to approximately half an inch to a quarter inch of the wire's length. For faster tinning, Set your soldering iron to 800 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and apply flux to the wire before soldering. Create a small loop at the end of one of the shorter wires. This loop will hold more solder and help secure the two MOSFETs together. Tin the tips of the other two longer wires minimally, ensuring that you will still be able to cut the tin part to fit the pad using the flush cut tool. Once the wires are ready, add flux to the MOSFETs and tin the corresponding pads. Begin by soldering the ground wire. Solder the two longer pads of the source together, and if possible, also solder it to the small pad to provide stability for later handling. Solder the other two shorter wires to the large pad the drain, and try to solder them to the small pad as well for added stability. Apply additional flux to solder the other two longer wires to the source pad. Remember to cut the tin part of the wire to fit only the pad size. This step might be more challenging, so apply flux as needed to ensure a solid joint. Hold the wire where you intend to bend it. If you have successfully completed these steps, you should not encounter any difficulties in the remaining steps of the process. Properly preparing the MOSFETs is crucial for their stability and performance in the modification process. Take your time and ensure the wires are securely soldered to the appropriate pads. To continue, follow these steps to open the console and remove certain components. Start by removing the backplate of the console. Use a Tri.Y00 screwdriver to remove the four 6.3mm long Tri.Y00 screws from the back, as well as the two Phillips number 00 screws located on the top and bottom. To pry off the backplate, begin at the bottom, and then proceed to the left and right sides. Gently lift and remove one corner at a time. Reference the Ifixit Nintendo Switch Lite Screen Replacement Guide. Link provided in the description for helpful visuals during reassembly. Remove the shield by unscrewing the three silver Phillips screws and one yellow screw. The silver screws secure the shield to the metal frame, while the yellow screw secures it to the plastic housing. Disconnect the power cable which is located under a flex cable. Take care to keep the pins and the flex cable clean. If you are not removing the motherboard, it is recommended to replace the flex cable after disconnecting the battery. Removing the motherboard is not advised unless you have experience and confidence in handling the flex cable connectors and remembering the correct placement of all the screws. Proceed to remove the heatsink while ensuring that you do not bend it. The heatsink is delicate and cannot be bent back into shape if damaged. Exercise caution when removing it. To remove the heat spreader from the CPU, you will need to bend three of the seven anchor points. The two on the bottom and the one on the left. Use a sewing needle to gently pry open the anchor points. Insert the tip of the needle into a hole. Pry slightly to create enough space, and then fully pry it open. Be careful not to scratch any traces on the board during this process. Clean the thermal paste off the CPU die by removing most of the thermal paste with a clean cloth or paper towel. Then, use 91% or higher isopropyl alcohol to thoroughly clean the die. This is also a good time to clean the heatsink and the heat spreader. Be cautious not to bend the heatsink's heat pipe during the cleaning process as they are not forgiving if damaged. Following these steps will allow you to access and clean the necessary components for the modification process. Remember to handle the console with care and pay attention to delicate parts, such as the heatsink and heat spreader. To proceed with soldering the wires, follow these steps. Begin by tinning the pads where the wires will be soldered. Apply flux to the pads, using the surrounding pads as reference points to determine where to apply the flux. Tim the correct pad, again using the surrounding pad as a reference point. Clean off any old flux residue and apply fresh flux to the pads. The amount of flux used will depend on personal preference, but keep in mind that more flux can make soldering easier while also requiring more time for flux cleanup. If you're having trouble achieving a good joint, apply more flux to assist in the soldering process. Ensure that the wire you're using is longer than 3 inches for ease of handling. Once the wire is tinned, trim the excess, so that only the tin part of the wire remains over the pad. You do not want excess wire protruding, as it will make it more challenging to clean the flux later on.
Moving on to the CPU, tin the capacitor with leaded solder and apply flux to the ground pad. To make tinning the ground pad easier, you can apply flux and gently scratch it with the sewing needle. Clean off any flux residue after tinning. Pass the wires through a small hole on the CPU, preferably not the one in the corner, but the one next to it. Avoid passing the wires through the corner hole, as it may require cutting part of the heat spreader, which could cause issues near the screw hole without clear understanding of why. Taking the time to pass the wires through the small hole is recommended. Assuming you have tinned the ground wire by half an inch, solder it to the ground pad. Take care not to overheat the wire, as it could detach from the MOSFETs. This will help keep the MOSFETs from moving during the soldering process. Trim, tin, and bend the wires that go to the capacitors. Ensure that these wires are not touching anything else especially if they were tinned and might have excess solder. The tinning process is mainly done for faster soldering when dealing with a large number of wires. By following these steps, you can effectively solder the wires to the appropriate pads and ensure secure connections. Remember to be careful with heat control during soldering to prevent wire detachment or damage to surrounding components. After completing the soldering process, the next steps involve cleaning the flux off the board, inspecting all the joints, fixing any faulty joints or solder spikes, and cleaning the board again to ensure its cleanliness. Next, you will want to bend the wires for DAT0, CMD, clock, and reset to a suitable shape, using the surrounding pads as reference points. This will make soldering the wires to the RP2040 much easier and more precise. To solder the wires to the RP2040, place the RP2040 on the alligator clips for helping hands, positioning it over the RAM, and aligning the bottom right corners. It's crucial to ensure that the battery is not plugged in at this stage. Proceed to bend, trim, tin, and solder each wire to the corresponding pin on the RP2040. Take your time to double check everything for accuracy and precision before removing the RP2040 from the alligator clips. By following these steps, you will be able to solder the wires to the RP2040 effectively, making secure connections and ensuring proper alignment. Don't forget to inspect the joints and perform any necessary touch-ups or corrections before proceeding to the next steps. To conduct the first boot test, ensure that the RP2040 is not touching anything. Plug in the battery and power on the console. If you see the console booting into a no SD card screen, it indicates a successful installation. Before completing the process, it's important to test the EMMC embedded multimedia card to ensure it's not running slow. This requires an SD card with the Hecate file on it. While I won't cover the setup process here, I will provide a link to a video that explains it well. Boot up the console with the prepared SD card containing Hecate to test the EMMC's speed. Once the switch starts up Hecate, Navigate to Console Info and select Benchmark. You will receive a message indicating whether your EMMC is running slow. While this issue is more common with the original switch, B1, if you encounter it on the switch light, ensure that your wires are not too long. If the EMMC is still slow, you may need to add an extra resistor to the CMD and DAT0 pins. With the knowledge that your installation is successful, you can now proceed to cover the solder joints with a UV solder mask. The purpose of the mask is to prevent the wires from moving and potentially damaging the solder joints over time. The UV solder mask serves as a protective layer for the solder joints, ensuring their stability and longevity. 
Now you can proceed with wrapping the RP2040 using Captain Tape. It is recommended to place a bit of Captain Tape over the MOSFETs for added protection. When applying thermal paste, it is common to spread it over the entire CPU surface. However, any method of applying thermal paste that you are comfortable with will work. On the heat spreader, you will need to bend the part of the side that may come in contact with the CPU wire. This will prevent any potential interference. When reattaching the heat sink, ensure that no wire is being squished in between. Take care to align everything properly. To keep the RP2040 from moving, you can use double-sided tape or more captain tape for added stability. If you wish to reinstall the shield, you will need to cut a hole in it to accommodate the RP2040. The metal of the shield is soft enough that you can use the flush cut tool to cut the hole. Once the shield is back in place, it is recommended to perform another EMMC benchmark, as sometimes the wire placement may cause a slow EMMC issue. The reason behind this occurrence is not entirely clear. Finally, close up the console and perform one last benchmark to ensure everything is functioning as expected. With these steps completed, your modification process is finished.